Here's the anchor verse. You can write this down. Anchor verse for actually our entire series. We've been talking about Psalms 5110. Create in me. Now I love this create word. Because in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, it says that he shaped and molded both male and female, two genders, by the way, he shaped us and molded us in his image. Create in me, shape, mold in me a clean heart. How many of y'all need a clean heart? And renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. A couple weeks ago, I talked about the definition of the word steadfast, and this is it. It says this, firmly fixed in place, immovable, unwavering. How many of y'all want a firmly fixed in place, immovable, unwavering heart for the things of God? So that when the wind blows and ideology and people's opinion and public opinion and, and, and culture and wh whoever's in the White House, whatever ends up happening, no, no, I'm not moved. Why? Because I'm a child of the Most High God who is the King of Kings, who is the Lord of Lords. I'm preaching better. I'm gonna lose my voice again. Y'all better shout. All right, that's enough. All right, the title of week four, if it starts in the heart, if you're taking down notes, you can take a picture of this, is the impact of gratitude. There's a significant impact when we live as grateful people. When we live with a perspective of gratitude. Now, I'm very aware and empathetic around this time of year. They say the depression rates go up, that anxiety goes up, that people are are having to walk out uh, their first Thanksgiving, the first Thanksgiving without that loved one, the first Thanksgiving after that divorce, the first Thanksgiving after that diagnosis. But I also know that as a child of the Most High God, God will give you, and I'm telling you, if you'll lean in today, not disconnect, God will reveal to you through his word the posture and the position of gratitude. All of us have something that we can be grateful over. If you believe that, say A. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you that you give us ears to hear. Most importantly, God, we need a heart ready to understand. Create in us, oh God, a clean, a pure heart, a right and steadfast spirit, God. We want to be unwavering, immovable. And God, I thank you today for the deposit and go Texans in Jesus' name. Come on. I had somebody yell last service. They were like, go Cowboys. I'm like, I thought the Cowboys was a flag football team. I didn't even know. They were a real team anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. So I read an article. This is going to help somebody, or maybe not. This is just maybe a filler for time. Uh, I read uh, four steps to avoid drama during Thanksgiving. Does anybody want to know what those four steps somebody are like? All right. I don't typically take notes, but let's go. <laughs> so here's the first one. It says, don't talk about sports debates, money, or politics. Just keep it real neutral. Just don't, don't go in combative with family members. Uh, number two was don't talk much about anything. Just kind of keep it real airy. Just kind of, just keep it. Number three was don't talk, just eat. Just, just look at people and just eat. And then the last one was just don't go. Just don't even go. <laughs> That's terrible. Just don't even show up. Just be like, ah, I'm going to pass. I'll be there quarter past never. Okay, great. Uh, when I revealed at Midweek Chapel this week that I have to be gluten-free and that my wife's going to put like cashew cheese on things and I'm about to figure out how to survive Thanksgiving, I had a lady come up and she's like, are you serious, Pastor Daniel? My mom makes the best ham and biscuit brickle brackle with French cut beans. I'm like, what was that? She's like, yeah, with frizzy bixels and oven roasted smoked turkey smash. And of course, we'll have special special roasted yams. I'm like, are you Dr. Seuss? What are you? <laughs> so many different cultures of food in our church. You know what I want to talk about? I want to talk about that extra cheesy mac and cheese. Come on. I want to talk about greens. Come on, somebody. Sweet potato casserole corn casserole. I got greens, beans, tomatoes, potatoes. Oh, you need! Like, that's what I want to talk about. Pashaki, please. Let me have one day of default. I feel like somebody should have given God praise right there. They're like, pumpkin pie, pecan or pecan pie. I don't know where you come from, but it's a beautiful, beautiful journey. It's going to be great. And as Thanksgiving approaches, I felt really strong from the Holy Spirit at the perfect moment to talk about a perspective of gratitude was this weekend as we close out, talk about the impact of gratitude. If you were with us 
at Midweek Chapel, which by the way is 11 a.m. every Wednesday, except the next two. We're actually moving downstairs officially, I believe, December 11th. December 11th, which happens to be my birthday. What are we talking about? I don't need a candle or anything. You guys just wish me happy birthday. It's fine. But December 11th, Midweek Chapel, I'm going to preach. And uh, we're moving. If you've ever been to Midweek Chapel, we're upstairs. We're actually moving downstairs to double the space because we've outgrown that room. Y'all have been showing up. It's been beautiful. But I preached and talked about gratitude. And I, I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me a little bit more for this weekend for all of our campuses. So before we dive in, I want you to look at the person again next to you and smile real big and just say, hey, I'm really thankful for you. Come on, let them know. I'm really, really thankful for you. And then look at your second choice and say, and you too, and you too. <laughs> now look at me. Why did you have us do that? I read this thing the other day that says people will hear your words, but they'll see your attitude. Some of you are like, yeah, I'm thankful for you. Like, please, I hate when he does that. Why does he make us talk to people? Like, that's exactly why I make you talk to people. Some of y'all haven't talked to humans in a long time. I'm trying to help you. But even throughout this Thanksgiving season, when you go hang out with that family, you know, the ones that you maybe didn't sign up for, amen. They'll read your attitude, even beyond what you're saying with your words. So we're gonna unpack the heart behind that today and the impact of gratitude and how it really does impact our lives in a significant way. Gratitude has the power to shift our perspective and change our lives for the better. Even research backs this up. A major university did a study that shows, like Houston Community College, did a major uni... No, I'm just kidding. That wasn't true. Uh, Tulsa Welding School. They did a huge study that said that when you live a life of gratitude, this is what this massive Ivy League school came up with. They said it, that you live a life of, of, with a perspective of gratitude. When you live more optimistic than pessimistic, it reduces overall stress and anxiety. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Less panic attacks. Less restlessness. It boosts your overall mood and energy. It improves your overall sleep quality. Come on, somebody wave at me if you enjoy sleep. Come on. Where's all the new parents at? They're like, I sleep two hours a night. I sleep. How many of y'all enjoy, like, you like your pillow? Like, you protect that thing. Like, hey, where's my pillow? One of your kids take it. Like, I've cut people for less. You leave my, leave my pillow. <laughs> no, it, it improves your overall sleep quality. Strengthens your immune system. When you're more optimistic in life, when you have a perspective and a heart of gratitude. It builds deeper, stronger, longer lasting relationships. Because if people avoid you when you walk into a room, they're probably not the problem. Depends on how you respond and how you act. So let me ask this. I had Isaac, one of our team members, I said, will you just chug half a bottle of water? I need it to be perfectly half empty. So some of you would look at this and be like, hey, Pastor Daniel, like, hey, somebody needs to go get him another another water. I've got a full one here, so calm down. Um, but how many of y'all would say, yeah, that bottle's half empty? Wave at me if it's half empty. I know y'all are like, you're not going to make me lift my hand. Let's see. <laughs> how many of y'all would say it's half full? Okay. So the difference between a half empty mentality or a half full mentality. See, some would look at this and be like, oh, crud. Like, I got to get my water in. Like, I need to drink like a gallon plus every single day. Some are like, there's water and coffee. I can drink that. So when I'm drinking water, some would look at this and be like, hey, we got to get him another water. He, he's almost finished it. Others would say, hey, it's half full. Pastor Daniel, great job. You're like, you, you, you're going to need another bottle of water because you're like literally hitting your quota of water a day. There are statistics that back how you approach life. Do you approach life like it's Monday? Mondays are always awful. Tuesdays are like terrible Tuesdays, so it's fine. Wednesdays are like, oh, redo Wednesday. Okay, great. Thursday, like, oh, I'm closer to the weekend. Thank God. Friday, like, who's hanging out with me? Nobody. I'm the worst. Saturday, okay, at least I get to sleep in a little bit. Sunday's church. Okay, God, I'll put a little bit in the bucket. The bearded wonder asked me to. And we live with this mentality that says the rain is always pouring. But a forever optimist would say, oh, it's raining. That means God's watering the earth. Oh, it's sunny outside. That means I can get some vitamin D. I need a shift of perspective. Now, listen, I'm preaching to the choir because not every day is 
butterflies and daisies and exciting. Now, Pastor Jackie is, is a forever optimist. But I've preached this for a long time. You're either a thermostat that adjusts the temperature or you're just a thermometer that tells the temperature. Do you want to shift the atmosphere in the room? Come on, wave at me if you want to be an atmosphere shifter. Only 35 of you. Amen. Well, because here's the truth. Aligning your life with a heart of gratitude ultimately helps us fall into a cadence and fall into step with God's purpose. Well, how is this? Number one, write this down. A heart of gratitude helps us see the bigger picture. There's more to life than just the day-to-day -day grind. There's more to life than like, well, I'm focused. I got my grind set mindset. No, no, there's more to life. There's a bigger picture. And gratitude ultimately helps us have an overall healthier perspective because it's easy, and I'm preaching the choir here. It's easy to get stuck focusing on the negative. How many of y'all have fallen into that trap before? And nothing's ever working out for me. I don't understand why this isn't going well for me. Why is it going well for her? I know she's a chain smoker. Like, we throw shade at everybody else, wondering why it's not working for me. How did he find love? For real? Like, I don't understand. It's easy to get stuck focusing on the negative. What we don't have, what went wrong, what we wish was ultimately different. But gratitude, gratitude helps us see the big picture. The bigger picture, it helps us recognize how God, this is good news, is working things together for our good. And ultimately, we'll work things out. Work things out in difficult seasons. I read this story about this guy, true story, this guy complained all the time. His coworkers could finish his sentence about how frustrated he was with his old car. Yeah, 100 degrees outside heat index, Humidity's 100%, so I feel like I'm being waterboarded just driving in that old car. Well, I thought you had air conditioning. Yeah, but it barely works. I mean, complained all the time. He'd give coworkers rides that had to Uber or, or couldn't even make it to work. And they, he'd complain the whole time. They'd be like, at least you have a car. And he'd be like, yeah, at least I have a junk car. And so that junk car stopped working. And he woke up, had to be at work. Nobody could come get him. And he ended up walking in 90 degree heat, two and a half, almost three miles. And about halfway through the walk, halfway through him complaining just to the air, he stopped and said, oh wow, I'm actually, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm actually really thankful for that car that got me to work in that barely air conditioned running air. At least I showed up to work like not fully sweating out my shirt like, Wow, God, thank you for that card. And his frustration turned to Thanksgiving, the rest of the walk. And he walked in and his coworkers had heard about it and they kind of avoided him. And he's like, no, I'm actually really thankful today. They're like, why? Did you hitchhike? How'd you get here? He's like, no, I'm just really thankful. And I'm gonna, I feel like I'm gonna get my car fixed. And, and, and I'm just really grateful that I even have a car. Because watch this, sometimes we only realize our blessings we only realize the blessings we have until after they're gone. How many of y'all, would, would, you would own that. You would say that, I, I agree. I, uh, God, I don't know why this isn't working out. And then after it's over, you're like, golly, that was actually, that was actually amazing. I'm grateful for, no, we actually end up realizing our blessings after they're gone, but gratitude will help you see what God is doing in your life, even the little things in the right now. How many of y'all are grateful for even the little things that he's doing? So later on, a friend of his that worked for him said, hey, I'm gonna help you fix your car. Uh, let, let, let's go look at it. They were able to fix it for a couple hundred bucks. And he said, you know what happened from that day on? I never complained again about that car that had barely cold air conditioning. He said, instead, I walked in every day to work. Like, I'm, I'm grateful I have a car. I'm grateful that I'm not fully, like I'm a little balmy, eh? Man, keeps me young. Uh, but I'm grateful that I have a little bit of air. Come on, how many of y'all can see that type of perspective shift? Gratitude helps you have a healthier perspective. Write this down. It's going to be on the screens. Gratitude lifts our eyes from our problems to God's promises. It lifts our eyes off of our problems. And you keep things vertical. All of this may not be working perfectly, but God, I can trust you because you're the way maker. You're the miracle worker. You are the promise keeper. And I may not see it all yet, 
but I trust that you're gonna work it for my good. Romans 8, 28 says it this way. And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, say he's concerned about me, That means he cares for you. Causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and his purpose. How many of y'all believe that God has an assignment, a mission, and a plan and purpose for your life? I believe it. It's biblical. I do. He'll work it for your good. I'm telling you, he'll work it Every single day, if you'll, le- doesn't mean everything is going to work perfectly. Don't dismiss that there are hardship moments and broken and frustrating moments. But when you walk with the confidence with God through relationship, you'll just have this. It's okay. God's got it. It's okay. It'll be there. No, it's okay. God's got my back. I, I put this on my social media the other day. I said, be so confident in God's plan for your life that it doesn't bother you when things don't go your way. Because God's way is so much better. There was a guy that DM'd me. He said, you know what's crazy? I I just saw this in my algorithm. I don't even know you. He's like, "Um, I might follow you. I'm like, okay, this is weird. Um, And he said, I I, I was trying to get this job and it didn't work out. And when I read this, be so confident in God's plan for your life that it doesn't bother you when it doesn't go your way because God's way is so much better. He said, it gave me so much hope to trust him even when I can't track him. Come on, somebody. All right, number two, you can write this one down. A heart of gratitude turns ordinary moments into joyful ones. Turns ordinary, everyday moments into joy-filled ones. Life is full of simple, everyday moments that we often overlook, like waking up, (laughs) sharing a meal, a kind word from a friend. Gratitude takes these ordinary moments and shifts the perspective into something extraordinary. Ordinary moments into joyful ones. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says it this way. Always be joyful. Oof, okay, that's a little challenging. Verse 17 says, never stop praying. All right, come on, all you seasoned saints. Verse 18, though, watch this. This is the tough one. Be thankful. In what? How much? Be thankful in all circumstances. I hate this job. Be thankful for it. I don't like this house. Be grateful you have a roof over your head. I didn't like this meal. At least you had a hot pocket. Amen. It was a lean pocket. Well, you're getting healthier. Amen. (laughs) For this is what? God's will for you. Who belong to Christ Jesus. See, when you walk lock step in cadence through relationship with Jesus, Yeah, it's God's will for you to always be joyful, to never stop praying, to be thankful in all circumstances. And this isn't a suggestion, y'all. This is a directive. Gratitude transforms the mundane into something meaningful. It takes the everyday mundane moments into something significant. Think about the sunrise. We see it every morning. But how often do we just stop and say, wow, you do all this? You, You... You tell the sun when to rise and when to set? You tell the water where to, where to come into the, to the banks and not flood every, everything? You do all of this? I'm in such awe and wonder. The thing that I was so blessed by, Pastor Jackie mentioned this last week, I took my Daphne on our daddy-daughter trip. Uh, I start with my daughters at eight years old. Eight means new beginnings. And I take them every year on a daddy-daughter trip. And so for six years, going on six, in a few weeks, I'm taking Finley on her sixth trip. Now, she's an adventurous. She's like, I want to go to indoor water parks. I'm like, let's do it. So I've almost drowned three times. Uh, (laughs) But it's worth it. We're making memories. Uh, So Daphne was like, Dad, I'm eight. It's my year. And she wanted to go to Dollywood. It was so fun. And so what I loved, and I just stepped back. I went on my phone. Uh, I was videoing, taking pictures, and sending them to mom, and then I discovered last week that she hated that. Um, She was like, I wish I was there. You should be here um, at home, and I should be there. Anyways, please forgive me, but I'm doing that every year. I'm taking them every year to daddy-daughter trips. But I stood back at one point, and I just watched my Daphne. And they had this snow, like simulated snow moment um, where this Santa lookalike was up there because it wasn't the real Santa. He reeked of beef and cheese. Um, 
But I watched as the snow was falling, her trying to catch it, the awe and the wonder in what to us as grown-ups with real life stress and real life bills and real life issues. Now I watched the mundane turn into something so meaningful. I watched the childlike expression and the childlike faith. And I said to myself, as I was watching, I said, God, that's the way you want us to be. That's exactly how you want us to live, that we're in such awe and wonder of the breath that we're breathing, the ability to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover, the ability to lay our hands on something and that everything we put our hand to prospers, the ability to have creative ideas and creative thoughts and quick-wittedness. Come on, somebody. Like the ideas that God develops in and throughout your life and Yet we rip ourselves off every day because here's the truth. Gratitude is a choice. Because the same moment I was watching Daphne and on wonder, I was listening to another kid going, this is a real snow. What is that? <laughs> this soap? And I'm like, shut that kid up. Whose kid is that? <laughs> shut that kid up. I don't know who that kid is kid is. Yes, no. And Daphne's like, ah, oh, it's no. The kid's like, no, it's not. I'm like, Who's, I'm going to fight that kid's dad. <laughs> Who's kid? Stop it. Mundane into meaningful. Sunrise every day. Gratitude is like that. If we'll take a moment and slow down long enough, it'll make you appreciate what's been in front of you all along. Come on, you should clap. That was good. Somebody said, oh, but it's true. When we're thankful for the little things, it's a joy multiplier. It brings contentment no matter what we face. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. And again, joy is from the Lord. Happiness is something we can create. Joy comes from God to us and through us that becomes our strength. It's a joy that the world can't give. It's a joy that the world can't take away. Joy isn't about having more. That's a lie. That's a misconception. It's about appreciating what we already have. Gratitude fills our hearts with contentment. It ultimately amplifies our joy. This right here is an amplifier. For those of you who are musicians, uh, when the bass was plugged into this thing, all y'all know is like, I could feel it. I could feel that bass in my bones. It's because of this amplifier. And the subwoofers down here. We've got, we've got speakers to amplify the sound. When you live a life of gratitude, your joy is amplified. Oh, my joy is non-negotiable. Come on, somebody shout. My joy is non-negotiable. Because the enemy knows if he can mess with your joy, he'll mess with your strength. If he can, come on, daughter of God. If he can mess with your joy, come on, single mama. If he can mess with your joy, come on, dad. If he can mess with your, come on, brother. Come on, sister. If he can mess with your joy, keep you walking around pessimistic all the time, then ultimately he will, the enemy will rob you of some of the greatest days that God wants to Unlock Gratitude finds joy even in life's funny <laughs> and imperfect moments. Uh, there was a mom and dad who said to their nine-year-old son, like, hey, would you, would you pray over the food? Like, you're just, you're maturing so much. We hear you praying at night. And he was nine. He's like, I would like to bless the food. Yes, but the Lord blesses it. But I will say grace. And we're like, okay. And he said, Lord, I thank you for this food. I thank you for our family. I think that we get to sit here at the table and the dad's not on his phone. The dad's like, okay. Put his phone away. And he said, God, I thank you that mom's so adventurous with all these different recipes. And God, not all of them work out. <laughs> and I know sometimes she gets frustrated. But tonight, God, she's extra adventurous. And we're not even sure if tonight's meal will be a success. But God, we're also thankful for DoorDash. Come on, somebody. We're grateful that we can have pizza very quickly. The mom's like, boy, you're not even going to eat anything. Eh? Amen. Gratitude finds joy even in life's funny and imperfect moments. All right, this is a heavier one. Number three, a heart of gratitude creates strength in tough times. Creates strength in tough times tough times. That's why I open talking about Thanksgiving, because sometimes life feels overwhelming, and it's hard to find reasons to be thankful. But gratitude doesn't deny the pain. It reframes it. It reminds us that God is still with us, and that he's still working things for our good, even in 
the uncertainty. For some of you who would say, but I'm going to be alone this Thanksgiving. You're never alone. The presence of God is always with you. That's why isolation is so dangerous, because we believe the lie that we're alone. But the Spirit of God, the Comforter, John 14, 26 talks about the Holy Spirit as our comforter, our adversary, our advocate, the one who will res restore joy and help you in the midst of your, your low moments. I was talking to a gentleman in the lobby. I've got some friends in the room, and she's beat cancer. Come on, somebody. So let's give God praise for that one. But I was talking to a gentleman a few weeks ago in the lobby who's been battling a pretty significant illness, and every week I, I pray with him, and and he's getting a little bit stronger, and he goes in for another test, and he goes in for another treatment, and he came up to me about three weeks ago, and he just, his posture was different. Normally he waits, and, and we pray, and he's a little like, all right, pastor. This, this, three weeks ago, he was like, hey, pastor. I said, hey, did you, tell me what's going on. He said, you know what happened? You know what happened? I said, I said, what? He said, I'm not thankful for this sickness. I was like, okay. But you seem so, he said, no, I've learned. I've, I've chosen to be thankful in the middle of it. Because I recognize that I might be in the fiery furnace right now, but God has showed up so many times. I have felt his presence more and more. And more. I'm more thankful for my wife. I'm more thankful for my grandkids. I'm more thankful than I've ever been. It's crazy that this illness is causing thankfulness to unlock in my life. And he goes, oh, and I'm going to beat it. The doctors say I'm getting stronger, but I'm remaining thankful in the midst of it. Because again, gratitude doesn't eliminate hardships. But God provides you with the strength to overcome them. Gratitude isn't ignoring the hard stuff, but it's about finding God's goodness in the midst of them. And again, here's the promise, Nehemiah 8.10. I've referenced it a couple of times. This is a promise when you walk with the Lord, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nobody's forcing anybody to be grateful. Nobody's forcing any of you to say thank you to the person that set up your chair that you're sitting in today. Nobody's forcing you to go out there, I'm encouraging you to, but nobody's forcing you to go out there and thank the team, the dream team who makes that coffee. They're like, I burnt my mouth. Why is this hot? N nobody is forcing you to be thankful for the hours and hours that our team shows up and sets up these screens and the music is played and nobody's asking you to. Gratitude is a choice. Are you grateful for the breath you breathe? Are you grateful that in him you live, you move, you breathe? Are you grateful that he never gave up on you? Are you grateful when others have lied to you, he's kept his word? Are you grateful when others said, oh no, I got your back and then betrayed your trust, but his presence has always been present. This is one of the most amazing things about the impact of gratitude. Number four, a heart of gratitude will ultimately draw us closer to God, and that is the end goal, is to get closer every day to the, to the Lord. When we live our lives filled with gratitude, we'll start to acknowledge that everything good comes from him. Everything good comes from God. Brilliant businessman. Oh yeah, he's the one who gives you the power to get wealth. Person that wakes up with, with, with joy and says, I'm just, I'm just choosing to have peace today. Yeah, that peace is from him. When your life feels fragile and broken into pieces, he has the ability to give you perfect peace. All of it comes from him. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like the shifting shadows. When people change and jobs change, presidential people change and the economy changes and everything changes, the one who remains is our Heavenly Father. If you're grateful for that, you should give him praise. It does not change. And having this understanding and having this revelation, it deepens our relationship with him. It builds our trust in him and ultimately strengthens our faith in him. But again, it's a choice. I'm going to give you some homework. Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. You can write it down. It's not going to be on the screens. Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in the Gospels. Luke 17, verses 11 through, eight, through 19. I want you to go home. Here's some homework for you. Some of you are like, but it's school break. I don't want to do homework. 
There's a story of 10 lepers who encounter Jesus. In week one of it starts in the heart. I, I talked about how Jesus lived his life to be interruptible. He was never in such a hurry where he was like, sorry, Bartimaeus, you're gonna stay blind. Like, <laughs> no, no, he, he was interruptible. He walked slow enough for the woman in Matthew chapter nine, verse 20, with the issue of blood to catch him. He, he walked slow enough for, for Zacchaeus to climb a tree and for Jesus to say, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. He walked slow enough to be interrupted and he encounters these 10 lepers. Now, lepers, leprosy uh, is more manageable and even curable today in modern medicine. But in Bible days, leprosy, like it was a death sentence. You can't recover from leprosy. So doctors were like, you're considered unclean. Family members denied him. Friends were like, no, we can't hang anymore. So lepers would find themselves in their own company together, broken, dying, hurting, not valuable, dismayed, dismissed. And here comes Jesus. And it says that Jesus performs a miracle in Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. Go home and read it performs a miracle and heals all 10 of the lepers that he encountered. I mean, it's such a victory story. Like, wow, thank God. What a phenomenal story. Every time I read the Bible and I really live in a text, the Holy Spirit will put a magnifying glass. And I said, really? One out of 10? It says that only one. All of these guys are broken. They're in, a des they're in a desperate place. All of them, only one of them went back to Jesus and said, hey, thank you for healing me. And I thought about it as I was reading that text in our modern, our modern day of age now. How many of us go back and thank Jesus for everything that he's done? Every time I have a moment, I'm over here on the front row and every, every time in, in the worship service, I have a moment where I pause and, I, and I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude because I know where I've been. I know that I never should have made it. I, I, I know statistically I should have ended up an addict, an alcoholic, in and out of prison like some of my family. That was my trajectory. <sighs> Thank you for not running out on my family. Thank you for not abandoning my mom. Only one out of 10. And Jesus told him, your faith has made you well. This one man experienced not just physical healing. All 10 received physical healing. But this one man walked away with a deeper connection to Jesus. Because gratitude ultimately unlocks the door to intimacy with God. So I'm choosing, y'all. I said at the beginning of this series, as for me and my house, we're not only gonna serve the Lord, but we're also gonna choose to have an attitude of gratitude, and not just once a year, but we're grateful. We need to be a grateful people. We're a grateful church. All right, so here's your challenge, your big takeaway for the weekend. I want you to go home and I want you to write down, and again, nobody's gonna check up on you on this, we don't have enough dream team to knock on your door like, did you do the challenge? You're like, good Lord, how'd you find my address? This is creepy. Gratitude challenge, write down three things you're grateful for and share them with someone else. But here's the rules. I want you to write down something that's really deep and meaningful. Like if you talk about it, it moves you to tears. It might be your spouse, a loved one. Write down something that just, you're like, I can't even get through that. The second one is I want you to write down something that you're really grateful for that affects someone else. Maybe that's your, uh, your best friend, someone that you are in relationship with. You call and say, hey, I just want to tell you, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for being in my life in my messed up, messy, chaotic moments. And then the third one, bless you. I think that was a sneeze. Freaked everybody out a little bit, I'll be honest. I love sneezes. They're all unique and different. They're like, yay! Like, are you good? That was just a sneeze. You should have said, God bless you. We're like, I thought you were scared. God bless you. And to all the other campuses that don't know what happened, we're blessing a friend of ours in the room who sneezed. 
The third one I want you to write down. First one, something that moves you. Second one, something that affects someone else. The third one, I want it to be lighthearted. I'm just grateful that I have coffee today. Just something lighthearted. Because I need you to see meaningful moments in the little mundane moments. Significance in the simple. I want you to write it down and I want you to share it with someone that you're in relationship with. One way to really unlock gratitude and a grateful heart is to focus on this. Philippians 4, 8. This is our last verse of the day. I'll let you get out of here so y'all can get ready for the game. Finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right, confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely, brings peace, whatever is admirable and of a good report. If there is anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise. Think, this is the word, continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. I'm so grateful. Because when he marks you, when his presence marks you, yeah, you're going to go through things. Hardship will happen. Ah, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful that in the middle of that wreck a few weeks ago, and that kid hit Jackie in my truck at 60 and tore up his car. I'm grateful that he lived to talk about it. I'm grateful that her and my kids were, were safe and okay. There's things that I wasn't grateful that my truck got all jacked up. But I'm grateful that nobody else was hurt. We have to constantly pivot with life, not blow with wherever the wind is taking us. There's a difference between a pivot and the wind blowing you anywhere and everywhere. Come on, are you a grateful people? Come on, can you stand to your feet? So take the time this week, write down three things. Take that challenge, pass it on. Would you lift your hands towards heaven, open-handed? God, I'm thankful. We are thankful. We are people filled with gratitude. And even when it's difficult to muster up a little bit of thanksgiving, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would nudge the heart of that daughter, that son, that mom, that dad, that friend that would say, there's just nothing to be thankful for. God, remind them of just a little moment. Give them just a, a glimpse of your presence so that this gratitude, this perspective of gratitude can be really unlocked in their life. My friend Brandon Lake wrote this song with some friends called Gratitude. And it says, and I, I I throw up my hands and I praise you again and again because all I have is, is a hallelujah. Some of you are like, Pastor Daniel, I don't have much left. Come on, can we just lift our hands across every campus? So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Come on, y'all lead it. I know it's not much
again. Come on, every campus. Come on, we're grateful people. Hallelujah. I know it's not much. some noise. Come on. Come on, you're still breathing. Make some noise. Come on, he's not done with you yet. Make some noise. Now across every campus with every eye closed just for a moment, two opportunities. I'm grateful that anytime the Lord entrusts me to preach the gospel, that I have the opportunity to give these two invitations at the end of every service. The first invitation is this. Pastor Daniel, I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I really want to. I've been living my life for me, myself, and I. And the truth is, I've been self-medicating in so many areas of my life, but I discovered and realized today that I need a Savior. <laughs> the greatest thing I can give to my family and the thing that can give me the greatest heart of gratitude, I believe, is to follow Him. Maybe the second invitation, you'd say, Pastor Daniel, here's the truth. I used to be a grateful person. I used to live serving and sowing and showing up for others, but life, I'd be lifing and I got hit with a sucker punch and, and it's caused me to fall away and I've been living reckless. I've been, I got caught up in the prodigal life, but today I want to realign my life in sync and in cadence, lockstep with his heart. And I want to rededicate my life today. So one, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time across every campus. Two, if you're watching online, just say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you there. If that's you, three, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. We're going to pray as a family. I see you and you and you and you. I see you and you and you and you and you and you. I see you over there. I saw you in the back. I see you in the back. I see you in the back. I saw you, my friend. I see you. Come on, Hope City. Let's give God praise. That's amazing. That's just here. All right, I want everybody to pray this. Say this out loud. Jesus, here's all my shame. Here's all my struggles. Here's all my sin. Here's all my issues. I repent for all of them. Thank you for giving up your life for me, even though I didn't deserve it. You hung on that cross and covered all my stuff. And from this moment on, I'm choosing to serve, live, and call you the Lord of my life. Come on, Hope City, give God praise in Jesus, Jesus' name.